On October 7th of 2014, the world was introduced to the Flash TV show. It ran for close to 10 years, and while it had some incredible highs, its lows were practically into the Earth's core. So, with its final season airing in 2023, the stakes were high to leave an impact. But to understand what I'm about to tell you, you need to do something first. You need to believe in the impossible. Can you do that? Great, because before watching the final season of The Flash, I thought it was impossible to have an ending to a series be this bad for context. The Flash follows Barry Allen as he uses his super speed to fight crime and protect his home of Central City. Or at least he tries to, he's pretty bad at it. The show was actually really beloved during the first few seasons, but over time, there's been a drastic nosedive in quality, with every new season getting worse as the writers never learn from their prior mistakes. And you know what they say, those that don't remember history are doomed to repeat it. Bringing us to The Flash Season 9. It's one thing if this was a one season dumpster fire of a show like Naomi, but The Flash has been on the air for almost a decade, so you'd expect the final season to be a well thought out love letter to the series. In reality, what we got was a rush mess that disrespected or sidelined important characters, wasted time with pointless episodes, and didn't end any character's story in a satisfying way that felt earned. Like, I'm legitimately stunned that this is the season we got. Nine years for this train wreck. How does this travesty happen? Well, get comfortable, because there are more problems here than there are in an SAT practice book. So we got a lot of ground to cover here to fully explain why The Flash's final season is the perfect example of how not to end a show. This season picks up a week after the season 8 finale, and Barry has been having nightmares of not being able to protect his team as The Flash, probably because he tries to have a therapy session with every villain before he cuffs them, but that's neither here nor there. I mean, it's not like the season's gonna start out with Barry making the exact same mistake. Hey there, you must be new in town. I'm The Flash. Shut! Oh. So, this is the game we're loading up today. I'm gonna need alcohol for this, aren't I? Or better yet, a completely different show. Unfortunately, my favorite comfort shows like Brooklyn Nine-Nine are unavailable on US Netflix. But thankfully, I don't need to find a different cure for my depression thanks to this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Tell me why! Surfshark is an award-winning VPN service that not only gives you three extra months free by using my promo code GEODEAL, not only does it protect your privacy way better than the Flash Protect Central City thanks to their powerful encryption, but thanks to being able to change your location to anywhere in the world, I could trick Netflix into thinking that I'm from Canada and finally getting to watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Just one click and eh, you're done. <laughs> Thanks to Surfshark, you can access any geoblock streaming service with just one click. So being able to connect to an unlimited amount of devices, 24 seven support, and a 30 day money back guarantee, there's really no reason to not get Surfshark, especially with the three free extra months you get by using my promo code. Once again, thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and protecting what we do online with their amazing VPN. And now back to watching this painful show. Anyway, say hello to the new Captain Boomerang. He's just a normal guy with some high-tech boomerangs, so this should be a very easy capture. Wait, what are you doing? Why are you stopping again? What are you doing? You suck! Why are you throwing a lightning bolt? You are the Flash. He is a normal guy. Just run up to him and cuff him. What makes this worse is that after Boomerang gets away, Barry's just chill about it, not trying to find him, and instead just takes the day off. Why is this? Well, we find out that Barry is actually using his past knowledge from time traveling to the future to more or less map out everything that's going to happen with him and his wife, Iris West. This is why he says this line. I guess we're not supposed to catch him today. Which is an absolutely brain dead mindset. So just because your goddamn dream journal doesn't say you captured Boomerang today, you are perfectly fine with letting him get away and potentially committing several other crimes and hurting other people? Triple. Not a great plan. Our hero, everyone. Plus, this journal actually ends up getting on Iris's nerves, as she doesn't want to feel like her life is pre-planned. But nobody gets to unpack that just yet, because it turns out that as a result of Barry throwing a lightning bolt like a moron, he and Iris get stuck in a time loop. How this affects Iris too is beyond me, but we do get to see a montage of Barry being a terrible hero. 
You know, doing things like still not cuffing the criminals, Shut. still throwing lightning even though it didn't work the last time, and never learning from his mistakes when he's been going through this time loop over 15 times. Barry has been the Flash for almost a decade, has the most overpowered ability you can ask for, and you still consistently lose to villains who are fighting you with toys. Anyway, they find out that in order to escape the time loop, Barry and Iris need to take on the whole day together. I, I don't know. Look, if we're going to keep asking how every time something in this show doesn't make sense, we're going to be here all week. So, following this idea of the two needing to spend the day joint at the hip, that means they beat Captain Boomerang not by cuffing him beforehand or by Barry actually using his speed. Nah, he's defeated because Iris is packing some Dear God, this is the, this is the first episode. How much stupider can it get? Caitlin, I got your alert. What's wrong? I'm neither. All right, that much stupider. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to not Caitlyn, not Frost, but Keon. For context, Caitlyn Snow was one of the original members of Team Flash, first appearing in the pilot as the team's doctor. By season three, she developed ice powers and an alter ego known as Killer Frost. It's kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde situation, Caitlyn good, Frost bad. But by season seven, not only did Frost become a hero, but was separated from Caitlyn, creating two characters. Now in season eight, Frost died in a battle to protect the city, and this had a massive effect on Caitlyn and Frost's boyfriend, Mark. So the two try to go about reviving her, and the result is this character. So what happened to Caitlyn? Where is she? Caitlyn's dead, Barry. What? Caitlyn is dead. Caitlyn Snow, one of the last OG characters from Team Flash, was killed off screen? What in the name of Christ is wrong with you? This is the final season of The Flash, and you have the gall to kill off a character who has been around since episode one without giving her a proper send-off or even a funeral to mourn her death? What kind of drugs were y'all on to think that this was a good idea? <laughs> and, and actually, you know what? What makes this even more hilarious to me is that I called it in my last Flash video. Yeah, I made a season 8 video. Some of y'all probably didn't see it because it got age restricted back before YouTube reverted their policy on cursing. So here's that clip. The show seems to be implying one of two things has happened. Either this is a new personality separate from Caitlyn and Frost, which would make no sense in so many different ways. I am a f***ing wizard. Anyway, this plot continues into episode 2, where we find out through Mark that there is a way to bring back both Caitlyn and Frost. However, it's soon revealed that he is lying, and in reality, only one of them can be saved. This puts Team Flash in a tough spot, as now they have to choose which of their friends they bring back. However, that decision is eventually taken out of their hands, as because Keon is technically her own person with her own personality, she is given the choice to make, and decides to just stay around. So not only have we killed off a core member of the team, but now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12 episodes to develop this new character and give her an arc, which is only made more difficult when you realize that Keon has the mental maturity of a damn toddler. There is nothing natural inside Star Labs when there aren't even windows. Are we underground? Keon, do you like scavenger hunts? I have no idea, but I can't wait to find out. I promise I won't get in the way. You're literally a few weeks old. I wish I'd never been born. Which only makes me cringe when I see scenes like this. Or like this. I hate shirts anyway. Don, I mean. God, anyway, this episode also has the return of Hartley Rathaway, aka the Pied Piper, who's going up against the new fiddler who is trying to steal his tech. And after failing to take her down when she was vulnerable, as well as Barry forgetting his meta cuffs along with his common sense at home, Shut. she manages to escape with Hartley's gauntlets. And we see that she and Captain Boomerang are working together with the arc's main antagonist, the Red Death. The only thing we know about them is that they seem to be stealing components to make a cosmic treadmill, which is a device that a speedster can use to time travel without having a connection to the speed force. The Speed Force being an all-powerful entity that is the source of the Flash's power. Obviously, a very dangerous device for a villain to own. So, after realizing that he's probably not going to be able to convince the DoD to move the last component they need to Star Labs for safekeeping, Barry decides to put together his own team of 
friendly rogues to help him steal this device. Now, this entire idea of Barry breaking in with this makeshift team is conceptually moronic. For one, when looking over the blueprints for the base they'll be breaking into, the device is protected by meta dampeners, which is to be expected. But why isn't the entire base meta dampened? Like, genuinely, this world hasn't known about metahumans for almost a decade, and has had meta criminals for just as long. Why isn't it standard to have any and all government buildings meta dampened? I mean, Argus's, so why not this base? Actually, I know why, because that would require Barry to build a team of non metas. And I don't know if y'all knew this, but after the crossover event Crisis on Infinite Earths, the Flash just stopped building up his rogues gallery. We stopped getting the one time villains of the week and just kept dealing with the same ones over and over again. In turn, it made the world feel so much smaller than what it used to be in prior seasons. So, Barry now has to put together a team of metas, so let's check out the roster. We got Mark, which makes sense because for some reason the show is desperate to make him a main member of Team Flash when he was only known as Frost's bang buddy. Hartley, who works for more or less the same reason, he's chill with Team Flash. Then we got Hot Pocket over here, who wasn't really a villain, so he actually works too. Finally, we have Goldface, who- Wait, what? Goldface? Re really? The, the black market dealer, attempted cop killer, and overall dickhead, Goldface? Barry has no reason to believe that he would for a second be loyal to this team, especially after we learn that he sold out his girlfriend for a plea deal. Well, at least Barry is doing his best to protect Team Flash and his family. I'm supposed to believe that you can afford all this on a public servant salary? Oh my god, are you f***ing kidding me? You brought them back to Star Labs, your main base of operations? Are you a few chromosomes short of a full DNA strand? What the hell is wrong with you? Anyway, after some bickering and Barry revealing his not-so-secret identity for the 63rd time, the heist goes down according to plan. But once Barry gets the component, the meta dampeners turn back on, and we learn that Mark is working with Red Death. Turns out before Barry could recruit him, they promised Mark that they could help him bring back Frost. This leads to an all-out brawl, and instead of teleporting away because the villains want to be just as dumb as our heroes today, Red Death comes in to beat everyone's ass and temporarily dampen Barry's speed, allowing the rogues to escape with all the materials to build the treadmill. And here, the identity of Red Death is finally revealed to be... <laughs> you're, you're kidding me, right? You gotta be kidding me. You, you want me to believe... You want me to believe that this absolute unit that is Mark is quivering in fear because of this gremlin. <laughs> Okay, oh, for context, this is Ryan Wilder. She was introduced in the second season of the cancelled show Batwoman and took up said mantle after the previous Batwoman was presumed to be dead. She also became the CEO of Wayne Tech during her show's final season, which gives an explanation on why both the Fiddlers and Captain Boomerang's weapons had evidence of being manufactured by Wayne Tech. It's also revealed that Ryan has been missing from Gotham since right before the appearance of Red Death. This leads Barry to believe that Ryan's being controlled by the negative speed force, which is basically the exact same thing as the speed force, but for villains, as it draws and feeds off of negative emotions, and has been shown to corrupt otherwise good people, like Mina from season 8. Obviously, this means Barry needs to try and talk to her instead of detaining her first. Shut! Which leads to him getting captured by the rogues. He's actually the last piece of the puzzle that Red Death needs, as his natural speed is the only thing that could initially power the treadmill. On top of that, it turns out that the suit can work independently of Ryan, giving her time to pay a visit to Iris. And in this visit is where Ryan's plan starts to fall apart from the seams. You see, it turns out that this Ryan is actually from an alternate timeline, where as she puts it, the Flash is the world's greatest villain. During a fight with her Flash, Ryan ends up going into the Speed Force to hide, but then ends up getting spit out into this timeline, and is trying to get back to her own. Now, I could talk about how dumb it was to try and convince Iris to help you after you already established yourself as a villain, or how very hypocritical to your worldview it is that you believe villains can't change, yet you are working with them, one of which being a serial killer. He's working with criminals too? Performed. There's no such thing. Or the fact that you seem to have done absolutely no research on this timeline's Ryan in case Iris, a veteran journalist that owns a media company, starts asking some questions. Or that maybe, just 
maybe it would have been smarter to befriend Team Flash first and slowly manipulate them into helping you, considering you need both Barry and Iris for your plan to work? No. I want to talk about the Cosmic Treadmill. Now, the show has always established that this device is meant to give speedsters with artificial speed a way to time travel. But my question is, how are you able to use it to get to an alternate timeline? Seriously, how are you going to pinpoint your specific timeline to get there? You said earlier that the speed force spits you out here, so that means you really don't know how you got here in the first place, or how to use the cosmic treadmill to travel to that alternate timeline, which for the record, I don't even think is possible. Let's just say that this is how, how it's set up. Here's the main timeline, and here's the Red Death's timeline. Now the question is, if you are here, this is where, where we are right now, you are here, how are you going to travel to this branch? You, you can't, because if you're going over Ver 2 before that, then how can you guarantee that this is the events that will happen? Are you going coming back and changing something to guarantee this timeline will happen? Because if that's the case, then that's not going back to your timeline. That's going back to recreate your your time timeline. And if that's the case, then the plan still doesn't make sense because Red Death won't be able to, to go back to her original Gotham. It'll, be, it'll still be, be changed. It wouldn't be the exact place that she left. Like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And it's like, oh, it's not a split. It's a completely different line. Well, that's not an alternate timeline. That's an alternate universe. And yes, it's confirmed later on in the season that alternate universes are still a thing. But, but Ryan doesn't know that and Barry doesn't know that. So everyone should be like, this doesn't add up. Anyway, Ryan ends up pulling an Iron Man 3 and takes Iris hostage to force Barry to power up the treadmill. And it's at this moment when you realize one thing both versions of Ryan's have in common, and that is having the intelligence of a brick. The reason I say this is because it's made clear that Ryan needs Iris alive. She needs me alive, but I don't need you undamaged. And Barry has this fun little power called Flash Time. For context, his ability is really just us seeing what Barry sees while he's using his powers. Basically, everyone's standing still, and he's been shown to be able to use his ability to bring others into the zone. This could have been used to not only save Iris, but put down each one of these rogues like in the Season 8 premiere. Oh, but Red Death would have been able to react to that. Well, let me remind you that during Season 8, Barry was able to call upon the powers of the Speed Force for an extra power-up. So don't try to tell me that Barry can't literally run laps around these twats. But because the writers always forget about how powerful Barry is, he complies to Ryan's demands, but is saved with Mark having a change of heart, thanks to Talk No Jutsu. This, however, still drains almost all of Barry's speed, causing Mark to sacrifice himself in order to give Team Flash enough time to escape with Barry and Iris. Mark looks to have died, but let's be honest, who cares what happened to Mark? He is such a throwaway character and honestly has no reason to appear as much as he does during the show. Mark's life doesn't matter any less than the rest of you, because throwing away even one life is absolutely senseless. Keon's right. Oh, shut up, Keon. No one can- Wait, wait, what did you just say? Mark's life doesn't- No, not you, Barry. Keon's right. Keon's right. Keon's right. Caitlin. You called her Caitlin. You had a whole episode talking about giving her her own identity, and then you proceed to call her Caitlin? Writers! What the f*** are y'all doing? Did you fall asleep? Do you have amnesia? How the f*** did this not just get recorded, but reviewed, edited, probably reviewed again, and then released without anyone catching this mistake? <sighs> anyway, with no path to go home, Ryan decides her best course of action is to turn Central City into her new home. And to do that, she has these psychic projections that are throughout the city to enforce her will. Cecile Horton, a metahuman on Team Flash with telepathic abilities, then uses her powers to not just find Ryan, but also discover that Mark is alive. However, when Team Flash showed up to save him, it turns out to be a trap, leading to Ryan draining the last bit of Barry's speed. And like all speedsters, instead of finally killing or recapturing the Flash after you have him dead to rights, Ryan proceeds to reveal her whole plan to Barry, including her ace in the hole who is responsible for the psychic projections. That being Gorilla Grodd. He can't hear you. He's connected to me now. Where's his tribe? Last time I saw him, he was going to find them. Learn what it meant to be a hero. Like I said, this is your doing, Flash. After your crisis, the gorillas in Gorilla City lost their sentience and were scattered across your lawless world. Grodd never found his tribe because you left him with little more 
than a pat on the back, arrogantly thinking that teaching him your hero's way was enough. Now, if you take everything that Ryan says here at face value, it seems pretty straightforward. Flash tried to show Grodd the way to be a hero in season 6, but never bothered to check in. And after Grodd found out that there was no more intelligent gorillas in his quote-unquote city, he felt betrayed and blamed the Flash. But if you do any amount of research, you'd realize that this is actually a retcon of season 6. Let me explain. During season 6, we had a crossover event called Crisis on Infinite Earths, and it resulted in the death of the multiverse and the birth of a new one. This was a way for the writers to take shows like Supergirl and Black Lightning and consolidate them into one Earth, along with a couple of aspects of Earth 2 and 3. This was dubbed Earth Prime, and as a result of these new additions, OG Team Flash tech guy Cisco Ramon realizes that several locations on Earth have changed or just no longer exist anymore. Now, if we look at this map, we can see, clear as day, Gorilla City being marked. I mean, Gorilla City's part of Earth Prime now, don't you want to go myth-busted? Which begs the question, if there are no intelligent gorillas, then how the hell is there a Gorilla City? Now, you might want to make the argument that this whole map was just Cisco speculating to get a general grasp of where everything might be. And I would agree with you if he didn't go on a damn expedition to explore Earth Prime. On top of that, Barry had the whole hero conversation with Grodd in Season 6, Episode 13. Cisco returns from his trip in Episode 14. So you want me to believe that from then to when Cisco left the show, not once was it ever mentioned that Gorilla City was just non-existent? I find that incredibly hard to believe, and it just makes the inclusion of Grodd look forced rather than seamlessly implementing him into the plot. Anyway, Barry ends up meeting with Grodd again, and you guessed it, talked him into turning a new leaf. I, I swear, Barry Allen would definitely be one of those motivational speakers that would try to sell you their course that will change your life for the better. <laughs> Regardless, you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, didn't Barry get his speed drained? How is he going to fight Red Death? Well, to answer that, we once again need to go back to when Barry worked with Grodd during Season 6. During that time, Barry shared his speed with him. I, I think you can see where this is going. So, Grodd, over two years, still had enough speed in his system to transfer back to Barry to be back at tip-top shape. This is complete bullshit. There is no reason Grodd should be able to do this, as he's not the first person Barry has shared his speed with. He did the same with both Caitlyn and Sisko in Season 4, and this taking back your speed thing was never an option that countless times Barry has lost his speed during the course of this show. Grodd is literally just a plot device at this point, only being used as a tool to try and help the writers dig themselves out of this hole of crap. Okay, stay calm to you, let's just get through this arc. So Barry ends up taking on the Red Death, and even though he is clearly faster than her, he gets Spider-Man kicked, and only was able to defeat her thanks to the help of the new rogues, and a surprise appearance from Batwoman with a meta-dampening Batarang, which is actually a fairly smart weapon to have. So the day is saved, and we wrap up this arc with finding out that Iris is pregnant. Oh boy, this arc was painful to sit through. So many stupid decisions by not just the characters, but also the writers themselves. Like, it feels like this show knows what they want the ending to be first, and regardless of how little sense the path to get there will be, they'll proceed to force us down it. Season 9 made the foolish decision to not adapt the Atomic Banana Peel comic storyline for the finale. This absolute parody of a show refused to embrace its clownery and ended in the most appropriate and deserving way. CW's The Flash is the worst superhero of all time and needed to be killed off by something as pathetic as a banana peel. That's the real crime of Season 9. One good thing about it though, Allegra is a cutie patootie. Kayla Compton, if you're hearing this... My email's always open. Okay, well, we didn't exactly have a great start with the season. But, hey, there's still eight episodes left. That should give us enough time to set up the final villain, begin to wrap up everyone's story arc, and give Barry time to really connect with the rest of Team Flash before the show ends. So, what's next? <laughs> you guys are gonna have a blast in Coast City, especially at the CCC Media Expansion Party. Hey, Moon, hey, don't worry about it. Okay, just call us if you need anything. <laughs> oh, uh, Barry isn't in the episode. It's just filler. Cecile Filler, no less. 
Okay, okay, you know, you know what? I'll I'll give you a mulligan. It's your last season. I'll give you one past. Surely the next episode. My powers got erased. I think that the only person who can help me is you. How are we both police officers? Because we're in a dream. Yikes. Yeah. Oh, another episode where Barry takes a backseat. Hell, the main conflict isn't even with Iris, but rather Dreamer, a character from Supergirl in the most pointless cameo ever brought to TV. You know what? Fine, Barry and Iris are at least the main characters in the next episode. So, what plot do we have in store? This lab's operating permits haven't been renewed since your infamous particle accelerator exploded. That's why we'll be conducting a full DOE inspection today. Imagine this is all space time. Normally, it flows and stretches like this, but we can't do that. We're stuck. Are you shoving a porcupine holding a cactus up my ass right now? This is basically the same concept of being stuck in a time loop. So now you're recycling plot lines within the same season? Hell, they even have the same lesson! I don't want to know everything that's going to happen and when it's going to happen. It guarantees a future where we're together. It's Which is why I want to just appreciate every second of our lives while it's happening. I know, I'm jumping the gun. I just, I can't wait to be a dad. When do you think Nora develops her cookie dough craving? No idea. But I think I'll wait. Let her tell us when she gets here. Till then, let's just spend each day doing what we want to do in the moment. Th th this is a joke, right? I must be getting punked because I refuse to believe that anyone genuinely thought this was a good idea. If it was really necessary to have filler, which I personally think is a crock of crap, then these episodes should have been Barry having one-on-one -on -one adventures with the other members of Team Flash. Each of these episodes will be Barry imparting lessons that he's learned over these past nine years onto the rest of the team. Maybe an episode where Allegra isn't able to save someone out in the field, and Barry helps her accept that she won't be able to save everyone by herself, but that's why they have Team Flash. Or maybe one where Keon has an identity crisis after Mark leaves, and Barry helps her by showing how Frost created her own identity after splitting from Caitlyn. I don't know, but the point I'm trying to make is that there's no reason that Barry should be taking a backseat during these episodes when it's the final season! Which brings up a question. What makes this season so special? Nothing sets it apart from the other ones. There's no crazy cameos or callbacks until the literal last episode. In comparison, look at Arrow's final season. It revolved around looking back at Oliver's journey and the effects it has had on the people in his life. Here, we have an episode where Barry's nowhere to be seen and the focus is once again on Cecile, don't worry, I'll talk about that gremlin later, an episode where Iris is questioning her life decisions and is only part of the main conflict by sheer coincidence. It's actually ironic that this episode focuses on Dreamer when it's also the only one that put me and my brother to sleep. And when Barry finally gets some major screen time, what's the plot of the episode? Barry is over-preparing for the future, again, him and Iris are stuck in a time loop, again, and Barry learns that he needs to take things slow and let the future unfold naturally, a f***ing gen. No, 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 I actually have no reason to go over these episodes. That's how insignificant they are. I swear, if, I feel like I'm having deja vu over here. The fact that this is what you decided to do with your filler episodes is baffling to me. God, this is so much. That's for one solid episode. Please. God, just give me one. Barry, Barry, Barry. What have you done this time? Holy tits and all that is good. There is a God. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Episode 9, It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want To, may be the best episode of The Flash we have gotten in a long time. Let me explain. During season 8, Barry fought a scientist who made a device that, for lack of a better term, stole his age. After defeating him, not only did Barry feel young again, but his body actually aged down to 29. So this episode starts with Barry celebrating his 30th birthday for the second time. Everyone's here including Wally West aka Kid Flash and John Diggle aka Spartan. However, something is off with Barry as he refuses to accept Diggle's gift, being Oliver Queen's bow, and is dismissive of Wally when he tries to talk to him about his difficulties dealing with his past trauma. You know how I can project my consciousness into the speed force? I've been doing it to find alternate timelines. Since there are other timelines, there's probably another me out there who has already achieved enlightenment. You seem so in touch with yourself, can't you do it on your own? 
true awakening requires a deep examination of the self. And then when you have baggage like I do, it's just, it can hold you back. <laughs> what baggage? He's reliving the single most painful moment of his life over and over again. But before we can unpack all that, the party is interrupted by Ramsey, aka Bloodwork. He has the power of controlling his blood like a parasite. It has insane healing properties, but puts you under Ramsey's control. His goal has always been to share this quote unquote gift to the rest of the world, as he feared death after watching his mother pass away due to the disease HLH. Oh, how did he escape from his prison at Argus? Honestly? No idea. But he ends up knocking out almost all of Team Flash by putting his blood in the champagne, leaving our two speedsters vulnerable for Ramsey's mind manipulation, especially his new target, Wally West. Because we learned that he's the only one that has access to this new multiverse, Ramsey wants to use him to spread his blood across dimensions. And here's where we get something we haven't gotten from Wally in a while. That being good characterization. We get to see that despite all of his time away from Central City and focus on having a deeper connection with the Speed Force, he still hasn't been able to move past all of his trauma. We even get to see the slight anger he holds towards Barry. For context, Wally didn't become a part of the West family until he was basically in college, as his mother never told Iris' father Joe about him. So seeing someone like Barry living a comfortable life with his blood family while him and his mother struggled throughout their entire lives makes him feel like Barry stole his family from him. Add on to the fact that throughout the show, Wally never really got the same attention as anyone else on the team. Hell, they forgot about him in season 4, and being able to relate to Ramsey with losing a mother to a failed disease leads to him accepting Ramsey's power and, under his influence, killing Barry. God damn, they ain't screwing around. But before we continue, I want to point out how this episode shows the importance of developing these characters. Because, let's be honest, there is no reason that Ramsey should know about Wally being in the city, let alone the fact that his ability is connected to the multiverse. It's a pretty big plot hole, but the best way to hide that problem from your audience is by having great characters. The episode focuses a lot on not just Wally's trauma that never fully got addressed, but also connected it to how dismissive the writers were to him. And by getting the audience invested into the character, you can get away with a lot of sh**. Hell, look at the Suicide Squad. The movie had a lot of plot conveniences, but the characters were so damn good, they took our eyes away from those. And it's not just Wally that got this treatment this episode, because after Barry is supposedly killed, his soul is saved and brought to Purgatory, where he reunites with the man, the myth, the legend, Oliver Queen. Barry, Barry, Barry. What have you done this time? Let me express to you guys that I was terrified for this episode. I was convinced the writers were going to screw up this character and I would have an actual aneurysm ranting about it. But to my shock, they handled him with a lot of care. For those of you who don't know, at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths, Oliver sacrificed his life to become the Spectre and create this new multiverse that we've been living in since halfway through the Flash Season 6. His job is now to watch over these new multiverses and can only intervene when it's in danger, hence Barry not being fully dead. And it's here where Oliver confronts Barry as he can't send him back to the real world if there's a part of him that doesn't want to leave. We find out that Barry has been feeling extremely guilty about celebrating a second 30th birthday, especially after all he's lost. It's my birthday. Today. I didn't want to do anything, but Iris threw this party and you know, I should have been grateful. All I could think about was everyone who couldn't be there. Frost died fighting Deathstorm. Caitlin died trying to save her. I fight some random mad scientist. I get three extra years to live. Tell me, how is it right? I'm alive, and they're dead. Again, this is something we haven't seen from Barry in a long time. Him actually addressing these past events, and how they have affected him. For a while now, The Flash has had this need to be an upbeat, less serious show, to where dealing with traumatic events lasts one episode, we don't see conflict slowly building anymore with our characters, or friendships being built up over time for that matter. So seeing Barry's survival guilt on full display here is really refreshing. And on top of that, having Oliver immediately falling back into that mentor role for Barry was just a joy to see. 
When my father sacrificed himself, when he gave me my extra years, what was I doing with them? I was drowning myself in this sea of, of pain and darkness and saying, Ollie, if you just, if you cross one more name off the list, if you save your city one more time, then you'll absolve yourself of all of this guilt. And I was wrong. This guilt is never going to go away. It is something that you have to learn to live with. So that in all of this darkness, you could be a guiding light, a hero. These heroes don't stop running. And then we have the climax, where we have the return of Kid Flash, Spartan, and Green Arrow. We have Barry actually having a reason to not instantly win a fight, and while it is a talk no jutsu, it is a earned one. A Team Arrow reunion, a return of a Flaro team up, and this. Zero Zero, you have failed this city! Team Flaro not only saves the day, but Oliver's wind condition arrow and eventually getting his full powers of the Spectre back cures Ramses of his metahuman ability and his HLH, allowing him to never become a threat again. And we end off the episode with a return to Barry's party, where we not only finally get Diggle and Oliver giving their final goodbyes, which still baffles me that it wasn't in Crisis, seriously it'd be like not having Pepper or Rhodey there at Tony's death, but we get one last scene with Barry and Oliver, where the two are just having a beer and talking, and Barry confides in Oliver, asking him if he's doing enough for Central City, and we get this beautiful callback to the first episode. Well, Barry, you tell me. Do you give people hope? Are you moving through your city like a like guardian you? angel, making a difference, saving people? In a flash. I don't think that bolt of lightning struck you, Barry. I think it chose you. Don't ever forget it. Why? Why? Why couldn't the whole season have this level of care put into it? This episode has great characterization, a decently consistent plot, and respects the past. So why couldn't you do this with the prior episodes? It seriously boggles my mind and actually infuriates me more because now I want to know how the hell this episode is so good while the past eight have made me want to dangle myself upside down in an orphanage while the kids hit me like a pinata. The Flash. Oh, the Flash. The epitome of a showrunner's wet dream rather than telling exciting stories about a popular IP to new audiences. I have been here since the start. And let me tell you, I have survived a lot of bullshit. From Barry's trial, Wally's shelving, Mirror Master, and I survived the hellscape that is season 9. The season of filler. The finale that is such a whimper and all over the place that you'd put it down if it was an animal. Remember, this was the finale of the Arrowverse 2. What a dump. Anyway, big out to the Flash, and a Flash-tastic f*** you to season 9. May you rot in hell. But who knows, maybe this is a sign for things to come with this final arc, and despite it only being 4 episodes, it will give us a satisfactory conclusion to Barry and the rest of Team Flash's story. So, let's see. Many unbearable hours later. God damn it! I, I had hope. I, I genuinely, I had hope. And you know what? That's my fault for thinking that anything would change with this show. This final arc of The Flash is horrendous. It is quite literally the final boss of all the bullshit this show has thrown at us over the years. How is this possible? Well, let me explain. The first episode of the arc actually isn't terrible. It starts off with a small time jump, just so Iris can be ready to give birth to her and Barry's daughter, Nora. We get a glimpse of what everyone's been up to before Barry gets forcefully pulled out of the timeline and sent to the year 2000. 
He initially tries to find and talk to Joe without messing up the timeline, but soon realizes that he's arrived the day his mother was killed by the Reverse Flash, basically his origin story. This problem is only compounded when Barry runs into his parents after the Reverse Flash knocked him out. He actually ends up spending a good portion of the day with them until they offer him a place to stay for the night. Barry freaks out at this and leaves only to run into the Reverse Flash, who is reveling in his believed victory. Barry goes to give his final words to his parents, but is soon after attacked by Joe. He is being possessed by the negative speed force as a result of him interacting with this tiny piece of cobalt. Barry eventually defeats him by thinking hard enough, connecting with Iris, I, I, I don't know, and ends up dropping Joe off in his police car so he could presumably answer the call to Barry's house when his mother is murdered. Now, I do have a few questions about this. Like, wouldn't Barry just interacting with Joe and his parents at all affect the timeline in some way? Think about it, in the case of Henry Allen in particular, considering that he's going to survive the night, I find it hard to believe that he would forget the man he spent practically the whole day with on the same day his life got turned upside down, especially because y'all stated that Barry looks exactly like his grandfather. My goodness, Henry, he looks just like my father. Like how this day was never brought up is beyond my comprehension. Or what about Joe's situation? He just woke up from being out of his body for the entire day. You're telling me he would immediately go back to work and not just want to go home to try to clear his head, or at least tell anybody about what just happened to him. While these aren't strong concrete problems, it does start to set off alarm bells in my head for the future. And by future, I mean roughly five minutes, as Barry intercepts the reverse flash and tries to talk to him. Shut! Where we once again are reminded of the reverse flash's retcon of a backstory. I mentioned this briefly in my video explaining the series broken timeline, but for context, Thawne's new origin is that he used to admire the Flash, and as a result, recreated the circumstances that gave Barry his powers. However, right when Thawne was going to reveal himself to the world, Barry came and saved the crowd that was meant for him. And that is why Thawne has an unending hatred towards the Flash, because he quote unquote, humiliated him. I finally discovered ways to possess speeds, and just as I was about to present myself to the world, and then you save the crowd. I mean, you saw my greatest moment. I admire you, and you humiliated me. This guy is f***ing stupid. This was an incredibly stupid change, because it completely contradicts Thawne's character up to this point. Ever since season 1, the show has written Thawne as a cold, calculated villain. He's patient, but revels in his victory. Does this sound like the kind of person that would devote his whole life to making someone else's miserable just because he has to delay when he reveals himself to the world by a day at most? It's beyond me why they made this change, especially since his old backstory worked perfectly fine. Why do you hate me so much? I didn't always. I was obsessed with you. For so long, I wanted to be the Flash. I spent years figuring out how you came to be. Duplicated the reaction. I became like you. This ability to travel through time revealed the truth. My fate was to become your greatest enemy. I was never going to be the Flash. So I became the reverse of everything that you were. The more people you saved, the more you were loved, the more I had to take from you. That is why you killed my mother. That's why you ruined my life. Because you couldn't be me. I became better than you. I am the one thing you cannot stop, Flash. Th this works. It makes sense that someone who spent their whole life wanting to be a hero would become resentful after finding out that he is destined to be the villain. However, all this is to make up for not properly addressing this in my last three Flash videos. My new anger is directed towards Dip Twat Barry in this scene. For context, earlier in the episode, when Thawne is gloating at his victory, he says this. See, there's only two ways you can stop me tonight. One is to put me in Iron Heights right now and risk destroying the timeline, which would wipe that wonderful wife and family right from existence in just a heartbeat. And the second option. You have to kill me. Got that, right? 
Now, back in Season 3, Barry did actually go back in time to save his mother, and this had drastic consequences as it created a new timeline called Flashpoint that really messed up with everyone's lives. From that point on, Barry has tried his best to avoid ever creating another Flashpoint. Y'all got that right. Dead mother equals happy timeline. Okay. So my question is, why the f*** is Barry still trying to convince Thawne to not go through with his plan? Don't you see, all we do is cause each other pain. But tonight, you can change all that if you just walk away. Okay, uh, let's play a game here called Find the Logic. The show mentions how Nora's death is a fixed point in time, which is wrong, by the way, because not only has Barry changed it before in Flashpoint, but as pointed out to me several times on my Flash timeline video, Thorne originally came back in time to kill Barry as a kid, meaning he comes from a timeline where Nora survived, and presumably, Barry has become the Flash later than what he did here. But let's just pretend for a second the show doesn't have dementia. If Barry is aware that his mother's death is a fixed point, why even waste the time with a speech? On top of that, now that Thawne thinks that her death is a fixed point, why would he suggest to Barry to try to change it at all, way back in season one? Killing your mother. It's a fixed point. Barry Allen, if you give me what I want, I'm gonna give you what you want. You can go back and save your mother. This is actually even dumber if Barry doesn't believe it's a fixed point. Because, let me ask you, what if Thawne took your deal? Oh. Yeah, what if he did? Well, if we go back to our equation, if dead mother equals happy timeline, then alive mother equals very unhappy timeline. Or in other words, flash point. The you I know from the future, he's not this stupid. Anyway, we got a pretty cool full circle moment with Barry finally being the lightning he saw as a kid, and the episode ends with the reveal that Eddie Thawne, a character from season 1 who killed himself to save Barry and erase the reverse flash from the timeline, is alive. However, everyone believes him to be a man named Malcolm. He gets struck by red lightning, similar to how Barry did at the start of the show, and is given the case file for Eddie's death. Honestly, for how weird this first part is, it does its job setting up the conflict and mystery for the rest of the season fairly well. Sure, the Eddie stuff is confusing at first, but I'm sure part 2 will better elaborate and explain how this all happened. <laughs> you serious? Oh, right, I'm sorry, this is The Flash we're talking about, where explanations are rarer than a black diamond or a good MCU movie post-endgame. You wanna know what the premise is for the second episode? It, it's actually crazy. Basically, this episode takes place at the same time Barry is in the year 2000. The negative speed force has possessed Mark and is trying to kill Iris. Meanwhile, Malcolm is trying to understand why he looks exactly like Eddie Thawne, along with sharing memories with him. Now, there's actually an immeasurable amount of stupid in this episode, like we are reaching world record heights here. Let's start off with the softer points, being the episode's focus. The most interesting thing that is happening is the stuff with Eddie, and arguably, it's more important. He is the one that is eventually going to become the main big bad, so this is the perfect opportunity to really expand on his current headspace. You could have Eddie slowly uncovering the clues of his past, only to finally realize that not only did he sacrifice himself, but it was inevitably for nothing. For this to work, we need to sympathize with Eddie for what he lost, but fear what this realization would make him do. Almost like the whole section of Infinity War, where we got a lot of backstory for Thanos. However, for some reason, the writers thought it'd be a good idea to have him only in three scenes. What is wrong with you? He's basically your main antagonist, and you're just gonna let him bumble around like a jackass until the end of the episode, where we finally get it confirmed that he is Eddie? And yeah, that was the soft point to point out. What about the fact that Barry is only in the last five minutes of the episode? Final arc, and the main character is nowhere to be seen. Th that's just dandy. However, the biggest screw you in this episode is the negative speed force. Not only is this force of nature not able to kill Iris because of Deus Ex Speed Force Machina, but we have now confirmed that the negative speed force can possess multiple people at once across time. Now, yes, the show says it was just merely charging up its energy, but that doesn't explain why one of the time periods the negative speed force attacked was the one where Team Flash had a literal god in the starting lineup. 
Deadass, it's confirmed in this episode that Keon is a goddess, as she literally defeats the negative speed force by killing Mark and then reviving him. You saved me from the negative speed force. How did you do that? I returned you to Earth, the mother of us all. And once you were safe in her embrace, I raised you up. Oh my god, make it stop, make it stop, please, my brain can only handle so much stupid! On top of that, if the negative speed force is responsible for slinging Barry across time, why does it keep bringing him to points that could ruin its plan? Like, why not put him in the far distant past, or at minimum a time period you aren't in? We learned in the first part that Barry is locked out of being able to time travel, so why are you making your life more difficult? Not only is the negative speed force brain dead, but this won't be the last time that he loses to someone that isn't even Barry. Oh, don't worry, I'll get to you. Just wait right there. Anyway, the episode ends with Iris going into labor and Barry returning to 2023, only to immediately get sucked back into time to 2049 and the start of part three. This part finally focuses on Eddie and his internal conflict. He goes to the Flash Museum in search of answers, but we learn that the negative speed force is constantly in his head trying to convince him to accept their power. Before he could do so, however, he is intercepted by Barry and Iris' future daughter, Nora, who instantly recognizes him. From the looks of it, nothing of Eddie seems to be out of the ordinary. Hell, he's still at the point to where he believes he made the right call shooting himself back in Season 1, even if he has some conflict about it. But that thread of doubt is pulled on by Nora after she's possessed by the negative speed force, reminding him of his life that could have been with Iris. Now, you may be wondering at this point, where the hell is Barry? Well, he once again is not in half of the episode because we need to make room for the greatest character of all time, Cecile Horton. Call me Virtue. Woo! I hate this character so much. She's so overpowered, is used as a constant crutch on Team Flash, and gets loads of preferential treatment from the writers. I've already talked about my disdain for this gremlin in my video on Season 8, but for those of you who haven't seen it, Cecile Horton is a character who's been on The Flash since Season 1, but didn't become a recurring character until Season 4. She's a meta who started off with just the ability to sense others' emotions, but over time, the show pushed hard for Cecile to be one of the heavy hitters on Team Flash, not only giving her telekinesis, but also in this episode, the ability to project her consciousness across time. This character has been receiving special treatment ever since Crisis wrapped up. Hell, in this final season, where the focus should be on Barry, she not only gets one episode where she's the focus, but Two, and the second one is this current episode! For context, the Speed Force tells Cecile that she is the only one who can help Barry, because of course she is. With the help of Chester, she projects her consciousness to her future self, in hopes of finding Barry. However, she ends up losing concentration when she is told what her life is in 2049. Basically, earlier in the season, Joe, who she's been dating since season 3 and has a kid with, told Cecile that he wants to move out of Central City with their daughter, but knowing how the writers love making her essential to Team Flash, they agreed that Cecile would stay in Central Cities during the week and be with them every weekend. However, in 2049, she apparently only sees them once or twice a year. This shatters her as she starts to believe that she's a failure as a wife and a mother. But after a quick pep talk with Chester about controlling her own future, because he is the goat that locked down Allegra, so when the prophet speaks, you listen, she is ready to once again go help Barry. So, let me get this straight, writers. Y you thought the best course of action for this final arc was to not only have one episode where the villain's backstory gets sidelined, but in the one that's supposed to elaborate and explore his situation, gets constantly derailed by someone who should be a side character at best. Are you f***ing high? Genuinely, I just, I don't understand the thought process here. Anyway, Barry finally reappears in time to see a possessed Nora trying to manipulate Eddie. After managing to escape with him, Eddie tries to fill Barry in on the situation. I used to be Malcolm Gilmore. I had his life, his memories. What the hell? I've seen reactions like this too, caused by negative tachyons. This place, Malcolm's belongings, his life, it, it's all made of negative tachyons. Like a, a false reality. <coughs> what? Negative tachyons created this whole alternate reality? Alright, I guess it's time that we talk about the giant elephant in the room. That being the absurd circumstances of Eddie's return. 
let's try and break down what we understand so far. So, according to this show, the negative speed force brought Eddie back from the dead, and has been using negative tachyons to make him believe he was someone else. But if the negative speed force already revived him, what's the need of striking him with lightning? A actually, better question, what's the point of making Eddie believe this false reality in the first place? I mean, nothing contributes to his decision to eventually join the negative speed force that relates to this fake life. It all has to do with the one that he lost back in season 1. So, What's the point of jumping through all these hoops? It's enough for Eddie to see Iris and Barry's future on top of the fact that his sacrifice was meaningless. But now with the way that they revived him makes you wonder, how long was he alive before being struck by lightning? I mean clearly long enough for him to be a familiar face with his own lab at Mercury Labs, so did he never run into anyone that may recognize him at a place like Jitters? Maybe there really was a Malcolm and the negative speed force merely used his body as a vessel? I, I, I don't know, and frankly, the show never explains it. We're just supposed to accept the fact the negative tachyons are the answers to everything, when all it does is lead to more questions. What microwaves my brain is that the show actually had a similar situation to this last season, and regardless of how stupid the explanation was for it, it at least made some kind of sense. Let me explain. Last season, the original Eobard Thawne was revived from the dead by the time rates, and he remembers nothing prior to when he was resurrected. That's all you needed. It's simple and to the point. Hell, this could have worked in your favor. What if, now hear me out here, the singularity from season 1 that sucked up Eddie's body actually shot him across time? Due to some fake science, it revives him, but leaves him with amnesia. We can see that he has built himself a new life in Coast City, completely clueless of what happened to him, until he's struck by lightning, and his whole world comes crashing down as he slowly starts to remember everything. That's all you had to do, in fact it makes Eddie more tragic cause now he's losing two lives. Why make it complicated when you literally did this last season? Well you got me, by all accounts it doesn't make sense. Let's wrap up this episode before my brain starts to bleed. Barry tries to appeal to Eddie to not accept the negative speed force's powers, and in an admittedly decent scene, Eddie expresses his temptations to take this new power, especially after seeing how the reverse flash still lives regardless of his sacrifice. He also doesn't know if refusing this offer would kill him considering that the negative speed force is the reason he's alive in the first place. However, their conversation is cut short by possessed Nora calling out for Barry. He leaves and tries to stop her, while Eddie goes to see Iris before he makes his decision. Nora and Barry throw hands, and after catching him off guard as he tries to get Nora to fight off the control, she's about to kill him, but feels the need to monologue long enough for God's gift to Earth Cecile to show up and save Barry's ass. On top of that, making the negative speed force look like a bigger bitch by obtaining a new power out of her ass and Doctor Stranging the force out of Nora. I won't hurt Nora. But for you, I'm gonna bring the pain. Now get out of her head! Sometimes when I'm watching these kind of shows, I think to myself, there's no way it can get worse. There's no way. This is rock bottom. Not only have you wasted your audience time in part two, not only have you given a lackluster explanation on what the hell is even going on in part three, but in both of what should be the rising action of the conflict, you have stopped at every opportunity to sideline our hero. Are y'all just bored of writing for Barry? That, that has to be the explanation, because it doesn't make sense to me at all, no matter what backwards ass logic I try to use. <sighs> anyway, at the end of the episode, Eddie tries to talk to Iris, but only gets shut down in probably the most unnecessarily cruel way possible. Eddie, you once said that there was always three people in our relationship. You told me that's not true. I was wrong. It was always Barry. Even back then, if I didn't realize it myself. Good going, Iris. And without the woman he loves the most, Eddie decides the only way to get his life back is to accept the power of the negative speed force. As a result, the timeline starts to fracture and Barry is taken back to 2023 for the series finale. This is it everyone, the final episode of The Flash. Can it save this season? Probably not, but let's see. We start up with a nice callback to the pilot that I'm sure won't be worn out by the end of the episode. To understand what I'm about to tell you, you need to do something first. You need to believe in the impossible. 
then you need to believe in the impossible. And I need you to believe in the impossible. Why do y'all love killing my happiness? Anyway, we see that Eddie has brought back all of Flash's past speedster villains who have died to kill the Flash, creating his Legion of Zoom. Meanwhile, Barry returns and catches Team Flash up with everything regarding Eddie. However, after catching up with Iris, Eddie shows up as Cobalt Blue, expressing his commitment to kill Barry and completely screw up this timeline. We then get the lineup for one of our final battles. On the side of the villains, we got Godspeed, Savitar, Zoom, oh my god what did they do to your face, the Reverse Flash, and Cobalt Blue. Yeah, this is a pretty stacked lineup of speedsters. Okay, so who is Team Flash recruited for the soon to be epic fight? <clears throat> oh jeez. Uh, okay, we have Barry and Nora, speedsters, that's good, that's good. Uh, Keon, so they have a god who realistically should be able to 1v5 them, but th but that's great. Uh, Cecile, who, as much as the writers would love to pretend, can't think faster than a speedster. Um, a glorified glow stick in Allegra, and Mark, who can shoot ice blast. Yeah, half this group should be dead. But, let's see how this fight- WHAT THE F- Sure, let's pull more powers out of our asses. Why don't we? It's not like y'all haven't abused my brain enough, right? <laughs> oh, look at that. Somehow Allegra is able to use her teleporting balls faster than the reverse flash. Doesn't that make complete sense? And not at all undermine the top speed of one of the fastest villains on the show. God, please show. I am begging you. Make me feel something. God damn it, we're back with Cecile. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna pause this right here so we can play a game I like to call How to Win. The object of the game is very simple. I'm gonna give you all a scenario, and it's your guys' job to select the correct option of how to win. Here's your question You're a speedster who has just created speed duplicates and are going up against an empath slash telepath. Do you A. All run at her at the same time, considering you can run up walls, B. All throw lightning at her at once while you surround her, or C, attack her one at a damn time. I'm gonna give you all some time to think about that. Okay, time's up. If you chose option C, I'm going to have to ask you to submit to a drug test, because you must be smoking crack if you think that the answer is C. If you chose A or B, then congratulations! You have the knowledge of knowing that you are smarter than a group of people who write these shows for a living. I mean, this is crazy. Cecile is literally thinking and reacting faster than a speedster. Oh, oh no, oh no, 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 stop talking, stop talking, stop talking! Shut <laughs> Okay, we are one for two when it comes to stupid villains. Uh, perhaps Thorn could give better results as he snuck into Star Labs to pull an Emperor Palpatine on Chester, killing him, and... How the hell did Allegra sneak up on him? Also, please stop. Yeah, you know, you know what? At least Chester somehow survived this. To be honest, I don't care how this is possible. Because if my main man Chester was the only one to die this episode, I may have actually started a riot. All right. What about Zoom? He's fighting Keon and Mark, and ignoring the fact that for some reason now every speedster relies on these lightning constructs over hand-to-hand -hand combat now. He doesn't stand a chance. He literally built up the biggest lightning bolt possible, and Keon just absorbed it without breaking a sweat. Like, Mark literally just stood there and did nothing. Seriously, what does he add to Team Flash exactly besides abs? Anyway, we're finally at Eddie vs. Barry, where our villain has a couple of civilians held hostage and will kill them unless the Flash surrenders. Then all of a sudden, Jay Garrick appears with the ability to absorb the negative speed force out of nowhere. Just another trick I picked up from my Earth-90 doppelganger. I don't care if you have an explanation. That was a crucial power that turned the tide to the situation that you just learned off screen. Regardless, Eddie reabsorbs the other villain's powers and goes into the negative speed force to get stronger. And then we get this line. If Eddie wants more speed, he'll go to the source. This is the negative speed force. But if he keeps absorbing it, he'll overload it and kill himself. What? So, let me get this straight. The negative speed force spent all this time and energy manipulating Eddie 
to accept its power and it's just going to allow him to self-destruct and lose? You don't. So how do we stop Eddie? Now that he's the negative speed force avatar, the only way to defeat him is to let him destroy himself, just like the last one. What the hell is the plan here? It's not like it benefits the negative speed force if he dies. The only reason Team Flash is even concerned is because they're trying to save Eddie's life. Are you hoping that Barry not only comes into the negative speed force, but comes with the intention to not fight back and hope that Eddie kills him? Because if that's the case, that's a bigger gamble than playing Russian Roulette with a full clip. Th this is the final boss for the series? This brain dead jack off? You could probably get better ideas from a damn kindergarten. At least they have an excuse for their lack of intelligence. But that's exactly what Barry decides to do. After talking with Keon about trying to coexist with the negative speed force, she uses her powers to send him there, because Barry can't do crap by himself. Once he's there, he decides to say it with me now, talk no jutsu Eddie into giving up his powers. Now this is it, the final showdown between two opposing forces, the fight to decide the fate of the universe, and Eddie decides to give up the negative speed force power after talking for 2 minutes and 25 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> are you serious this is how you end the show this is your final conflict and it's just two and a half minutes of talking actually barry only says like four lines and that's it it's enough to convince eddie to give up the power that he was worried would kill him if he gave it up I, I must be dreaming. How do you allow this to happen? Th this scene isn't even long enough for a commercial break. I've had more insightful conversations with my stuffed animals when I was four. I've seen children books with more words than this. I've spent more time writing this rant for this scene than the writers put into this miserable excuse of a conclusion. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. One thing I'll say about Flash Season 9 is that it completely lacked consequences. Barry misjudged the situation with Red Death, assuming she'd be the new negative speed force avatar, but he beats her as he normally would because Batwoman shows up with speed dampening batarangs. Cecile gets a glimpse into the future about the fact that she sees Joe basically once a year because she focuses too much on being a superhero, which causes her to panic in the present, but the show just kinda forgets about that and there's zero consequences. The speedster villains from throughout the show come back, and they're beaten within seconds. Flash beats Eddie by telling him to stop being evil. Even season 8 was way more interesting than this, simply because there were things happening, plot lines to follow, consequences that carried over. Season 9 is just nothing. <sighs> and with that, that's basically it. The last 20 minutes are really just an epilogue. Baby Nora is born, Keon leaves while reviving Caitlyn, Joe proposes to Cecile- Hold up! What?! When Keon ascended, she didn't need her physical body anymore, so she used her gifts to return Caitlyn to her rightful place. Wait a minute, so you have just confirmed that Keon was just a plot device? Her, her character didn't matter, just the fact that she was a god so she could be a walking get out of jail free card. The writers literally had no idea what in god's name to do with Caitlyn this whole season, so they just wrote her out of it. A and look at everyone crying with joy, oh yeah, you're back, piss off. Y'all didn't even have a funeral for her. You treated her death as if she just went on a business trip. None of you twats gave a damn about Caitlyn. I don't care if the writers knew they would bring her back. The audience didn't know that, and neither did Team Flash in-universe. So for the love of all that is good and holy in this world, why did they ignore it? God, okay. Besides this travesty, the rest of the epilogue is actually full of really sweet moments. Barry talking with baby Nora, Joe finally remarrying, the little montages, even Barry deciding to share his powers permanently with Avery Ho, Max Mercury, and Jess Chambers are all solid moments. You know, besides the fact that it's been established in the show that Barry didn't just get his powers from the lightning, but also all the chemicals he was covered in. So in reality, all this would do is give these three a permanent tick. The night Barry was struck by lightning, he was doing fingerprint analysis. Those chemicals got in his system then, and they are going in now. We have to recreate everything that happened to Barry that night. Regardless, these are good moments, but only in isolation, because 
This is the biggest problem with the final season. None of these emotional payoffs were earned. They were either rushed or barely developed. Once again, Eddie turns from good to bad so fast, if you blink, you're gonna miss it. Keon was never given any major development, as she was practically a toddler at the start of the season, so her leaving made me feel nothing. There was no worry from Barry of not being able to keep up with his abilities as the Flash, or refusal to share his powers, so this moment is literally just for people to say, hey, I know that person from the comics. Hell, this entire arc took place over the course of a day. It doesn't feel like a nail-biting, tension-filled conflict, rather a footnote in an otherwise regular season and actually that pisses me off even more throughout this entire final season there has been small glimpses of hope and quality plus all of those nice moments at the end but none of those moments were expanded on or explored in any meaningful way besides the arrow episode Seriously, someone please explain to me the thought process behind the season, because to me, it just seems like you took what would be a run-of-the-mill season finale, slapped on some cameos, and called it a day. They had an opportunity to make a finale that would be a love letter to a show they've worked on for 9 years, but instead, we got this low-effort, cookie-cutter season that will be quickly forgotten just as fast as it aired. So that's it. That's the final season of The Flash and all of its disappointing glory. It's a real shame that this was the last impression The Flash made. It was completely rushed, had little to no focus most of the time, and kept making the same mistakes they've been making for years. But I think y'all have heard me beating this dead horse of a season long enough, so a question remains. What are my thoughts on The Flash as a whole? Well, the show is full of inconsistencies, has a timeline that looks more like a game of shoots and ladders, and fumbles its way to the finish line so hard, you think you'd be playing Quop. So yeah, as a whole, The Flash isn't a good show. But f*** me if I didn't have fun with it. Look, I think I ripped this show a new asshole more than enough times to where I deserve this moment. So, let me explain. I think we often forget that this whole video, internet, review, and breakdown thing is all for fun. Yeah, it's fun to praise a movie or show, but to me, and I'm sure many others, it's just as much fun to point out the problems, find inconsistencies, and get mad while doing it. To me, I see it like a puzzle, like, here's your crap situation, figure out how to get out of it. Yeah, a lot of this stems from genuine frustration of being able to see these problems that the writers missed, but at the end of the day, it's all for fun. I ain't gonna lose sleep over bad movies or shows. As for The Flash... I love the cast, they've always seemed like they're having a good time on set and have great chemistry with each other. Plus, every actor has become the definitive versions of these characters. Like Candace Patton is Iris West, Keenan Lonsdale is Kid Flash, and Grant Gustin is Barry Allen. Hell, as much as I question the writer's education level, I'm sure they had a blast working on the show, so can I really fault them for that? So does that mean that I think The Flash is the best show ever and this was all strictly for YouTube views? No, the show is an absolute mess and almost made me turn to alcoholism. However, I am kind of sad to see it go. The show has had a massive impact on my life in the strangest way possible, and I'm always going to be grateful for that. I may come across as harsh, but just like there are people like me who will meticulously break down a show, there are going to be people who just blindly enjoy it. It's how it will always be. One side will never take over the other. They'll just coexist. Nature is about more than balance. It's about coexistence. Huh. Maybe The Flash was right about something after all. Regardless, I don't know what the future holds for our Scarlet Speedster media, but I think we can all agree that the CW's Flash has definitely made its mark in history, and whether it's because of the absurd amount of inconsistencies or how much it expanded on the Arrowverse, the show definitely made us all believe in the impossible. Anyway, I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comment section down below. What did y'all think of The Flash Season 9? And did you guys like it? Did you hate it as much as I do? Just let me know all down there in the comments. It's over. It's, it's finally over. My Christ. This may have been the most painful video I've ever ha had to make in the sense of the effort that, that was put in, put into it to it at the time the fumbling of so so many things things like 
Like it, this, this damn near killed my my computer. Like straight up, I almost lost everything. And oh my god, it was. I'm going to have a full kind of like behind behind the scenes like post video yo video if that makes makes sense. Basically talking about how I feel feel about the video after it all being done and everything on the Patreon on Wednesday. So a little plug for my pay. Patreon, go check check it out. Also, thank you to, to Trevor for being a ten dollar Patreon on there. It's really unnecessary. Sorry, past past one month, believe me. But uh, thanks, I really appreciate it, man. Your support means a lot to me. This season, it it's over. It's the the, the show is over. And like I said in the video, it's a, it's a bit of a bittersweet thing in a sense, where the show has caused me so much pain and anger, but it also kind of helped build this channel. Like it's the it was the foundation and. I, I just wish it was better. I, I do. I do wish it was better. As much as the angry videos do end up performing a lot, a lot better, I do wish for just my own sanity that I just wish the final season had more thought put into it. That's, that's it. Also, thanks to Mad Sky and Jeb for lending me their opinions in the little, like, cassette tape record, recording thing. I, w I wanted to get some other people's opinions on season 9 in there. And these were the three that answered. So, <laughs> so they're put into the video. No, but seriously, thank you guys for lending me your voice today. It means a lot. Also, thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Remember, by using my promo code GEODEAL, you can get three free extra months when you sign up for Surfshark. Now, this isn't the last Flash video. No, no, no. This is the second to last Flash video. It's the last one talking about a full season. I don't think I'm going to go back and, and really go in depth into any of other seasons. There's other videos that, can, that have done that extremely well. I want to focus on something else for my very last Flash video. And that's the fact that we talk a lot of crap about these writers. We do. We do. We talk a lot of crap on them. So, let's see if we can do better. What I'm planning on doing is I'm hoping it'll be done by a, the holiday season or post-holiday -ho season that I want to rewrite the Flash season 9. I want to completely go through and figure out... Uh, what can we do to fix it? Now, nothing crazy changes. I'm looking at you, Matt. I'm not adding the banana peel as much as you want it. It's not going in there. <laughs> I'm going to be restricting myself to what the writers had to work with, and that's what I'm going to uh, be working with, to see if I could write a better er Season 9. But I don't want it to just be me. I want your guys' opinions on it, too. So leave in the comment section down below. What would you want in a final season of The Flash? But yeah, once again, thank you all so much for the support. It genuinely like means like so much to me that... Y'all, y'all still waited this long for a video, and I truly think it's one of my best videos I've ever put out. Like, if not my best video, it, it's the Naomi video is really good. Don't get me wrong; it's really good. But I think I just, I think I just lo love this video so much more. It, it's, it's a personal thing for me. And yeah. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you like to new channel, hit the like and subscribe button. Also, this channel potential hit the same buttons. Anyway, my name is Vigio, and I'll talk to y'all later. Also, live stream on Friday. <laughs> talk to y'all later. Peace.